So this is scraping the web. I know that the little uh, printed pamphlet was wrong. <laughs> it said it was at one, but this is you know this is the talk. It's at two. So if you're in the wrong place, go ahead and leave. Um, so just a quick one of who am I? Um, so I'm Derek. Uh, I'm a software engineer at SiriusMD. I start there in about ten days. Um, I'm a galvanized WDI graduate. I graduated from G15, and that was about April 2016. Um, I'm a Colorado native, so I was born in Boulder and grew up here. I uh, went to CU Boulder as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, I've done, done some scraping in my last couple jobs, and they were sort of everything from like pretty casual to like this is an actual feature in our product. And um, I kind of learned a lot about it. I didn't know anything about it sort of before I had a help work on some of these solutions and I thought it was pretty interesting because you know I guess it all kind of started a couple years ago when uh, I knew a guy who like taught himself Python and did web scraping and before I knew tech that was just like the most amazing thing in the world to me and so it's pretty cool being here kind of coming full circle with it and being like oh it's like really not that hard so um, I know Ruby and JavaScript pretty well so you kind of see that reflected in some of my solutions um, and then yeah so we can get started. Also, just I thought this would be funny. Uh, I was showing this to my fiance, and she had never seen the "Who Am I" command before. She goes, "What's whammy?" <laughs> I was like, "Oh, you beautiful soul." Sweet. So um, I was going to start this with a, a little quick disclaimer that, like, we are talking about pulling other people's data off of the internet, so you should be careful. Um, some people don't want you to do that. So there's this thing called the robots.txt. Um, that's generally where like a site would put guidelines and how they do or do not want you scraping their site. Um, I didn't really check any of those before I did this because I'm not really using this data for anything important. But sort of, I have to kind of give that out there so you know, can't just go willy nilly pulling whatever you want and say Derek told you it's fine. <laughs> so um, I just want a quick poll of kind of who I'm talking to. Uh, who here is a developer? Okay, everybody, nice. Um, so who here, who here has done any kind of scraping before? Okay, about half, sweet. So I want to start off with sort of like what is scraping. Um, I wanted to make this a beginner friendly talk, so um, I thought that Wikipedia had probably the best, easiest, simplest one, uh, which was that it's just web scraping is data scraping used for extracting data from websites, right? whoop de doo So, you know, what that really just means is you're pulling data off of someone else's site and you're using it for something, right? So, um, and whenever I've done web scraping, it usually starts with me copying and pasting things off of their browser a lot, right? And so then I've been doing it over and over and over again, and then you start to figure out, hey, I'm doing the same menial task over and over again. Programming's really good at solving those kinds of problems. So, um, this is something I thought kind of interesting. So there's kind of this concept between like web crawlers and web scrapers. So. Um, the kind of most common type of scraping is actually web crawling, probably by Google. Uh, Google estimates there's about 60 trillion web pages. We're going to get here in a second, sort of like what the differences between those two things are, but uh, it's pretty massive. So when they crawl these sites, they're really just like going to a page, kind of clicking around on every single link possible, sort of indexing all that information for them, you know, for their servers to sort of parse through and then index for you to be able to search through later. So um, this kept popping up, um, so I wanted to make it pretty clear that you know there's this thing called data mining, so scraping is not data mining. Data mining is more about gleaning insights from your data, um, specifically over time. Um, just wanted to make that quick distinction. So again, crawling versus scraping. In, you know, in technical terms, right, when you're just pulling data off at the internet, it's kind of the same thing, but there's some you know colloquial differences I wanted to go through, and I found this really handy. Um, uh, image that really sort of spells the differences out. And I know that this venue isn't the best. You might have a hard time seeing the bottom there. But uh, the difference is, is like a scraper will, you know, you can see it go down, right? Just visits all the links, builds a list, it indexes it, and stores it in their database. Scraping's different. You visit a website, you scrape whatever you want off of it, and then you do whatever you want with that data, whether that's turning it into a CSV file, you save it to your own database, you aggregate it with other data, you send it off to another API, whatever it is that you want to do. Sweet. So, I uh, wanted to give you sort of a high level topic. Hi. I uh, wanted to give you sort of high level uh, topics of what I plan to cover. Um, so, first off, it's sort of uh, alternatives to scraping. You, that's not always the right solution. So, I'll sort of help walk through the process of like 
making the decision to use a scraper and why you might want to use one and why maybe it might not be the right time to use one. Um, and so some of those alternatives, you know, one of them includes a paid automated service. Um, there are services that do web scraping for you. Um, there's a quick detour to sort of abusing other people's APIs in a way they weren't meant to do. And then eventually, you know, we'll get to sort of the meat of the talk, which is about hand rolling our own scrapers. Sweet. So why would you want to scrape? Um, these are just some that I came up with off the top of my head. Uh, there is no direct API for what you want is probably the biggest one. You need some sort of data and they haven't provided a nice interface for it, so you got to make your own. Um, and then in terms of like why you would need that data, I mean it's really up to you, right? I, I, when doing a bunch of research, I found some interesting stuff where a guy was like trolling through Amazon looking for books that he liked that were on sale, right? Um, you know, you could quick test of proof of concept, so maybe instead of like pouring a bunch of your own time and resources and building out a product, so you can sort of like scrape some data, populate your concept and, you know, figure out if it's worth kind of putting more resources into it from there. Um, sweet. So the biggest one though is obviously saving yourself repetition, right? If you're a developer and you're making a decision on do I want to build a scraper or not, I mean, this is one that it comes down to, right? I sort of mentioned it already, but it's, you know, have you ever just sat there and just copying and pasting the same things, right? Um, I think that's where a scraper would come in most handy. So um, the way I kind of wanted to phrase this is just imagine you need to build a scraper, right? And so the one that actually keeps popping up in my career so far is for job boards, right? So there are jobs and you want to aggregate them somehow, right? Um, so I've done this in several different capacities, and so um, sort of like the mental model we kind of have going forward is like you're, you have this problem, you need to sort of aggregate these jobs, so like let's kind of walk through the process of like is a scraper the right tool for the job. So solution one is kind of the one that we all start with usually, which is like are you just copying and pasting jobs? So this is how it started, you know, in one instance in my last job. Um, so the, the client had sort of like these different job boards that they were providing for cities and so they needed to have like a job board for that city government's jobs so I was going to those different sites and literally just copying and pasting their jobs pasting them into our system so they'd show up right um, that's super duper duper annoying right um, so it might be the right solution though uh, is this a one-time thing is usually the question I ask myself um, and, it, and it really comes down to doing some like math right if it could take me 15 to 25 minutes to just copy and paste it by hand, but it might take me three hours before I have like successfully written, tested, debugged, and like launched a scraper. That's not really worth the money when you start to consider like how much developers get paid per hour, right? It might be more worth your time to just spend the 15 minutes copying it by hand. Um, so this is sort of like just a step up from that, but it's pretty easy to go into Chrome, open up the console. Uh, a lot of, most sites, more often than not, have jQuery available, and you can sort of write your own little custom scripts to just pull them right out of the console, so you're not quite, um, yeah, you're not quite copying and pasting it straight out of the interface, but it's still sort of the same concept, right? Uh, solution three, you can always pay someone else to do it. Um, I thought this was important because I've actually seen this a lot. Uh, there are a lot of services available for you to be able to just pay people for grunt tasks. Um, so like there's Mechanical Turk is one. Uh, I think I have some examples on the next page, yeah. So you, there's always like Mechanical Turk, which is where you can pay people pennies to do really lame, menial tasks. Um, there's TaskRabbit. I saw a bunch of them on Fiverr, actually. I just was like, oh, I wonder if people are doing this on Fiverr already. People are like, I will do data entry for $4 an hour, please. So, um, and then there's, you know, I've seen this before also. People have just had, like, virtual personal assistants, and there's entire, like, businesses set up around, like, providing you a virtual personal assistant. So we start to do, like I said, some of that math you were thinking about. Developer, even like a junior making 75K a year, breaks out to about 36 bucks an hour. And, uh, you know, that could be 180 bucks if it takes them five hours to build a scraper. But if you can just hire someone for 10 bucks an hour to just do it by hand for the same cost, it's 50 bucks. So it's, you know, a third the cost. Uh, this is another interesting one. You could pay a service. I think I mentioned it already, but there are services that actually provide scraping for you. Um, and they're actually really interesting. I was, I was going into it thinking they'd be like really lame and bad, but there's some actually like really high quality services that will do it for you. This is probably the best solution if you aren't technical or maybe your developers are super slammed and you are just like testing a proof of concept and you need some data pretty quickly. Um, I have some examples of what those are. 
Uh, I found that to be sort of in two different categories. Category one is what I call hands off. It's very specific in what they do and what they scrape. You can, you literally pass it a URL and you get data back usually. So uh, one of them was like Listly, which specialized in returning Excel files. Uh, the second one there, Crawly, was just for articles. So you can literally just paste an article URL into the scraper and it would just return you like a JSON version of like the article, what it thought the author was and the time it was published and all that stuff. Um, and then I have what I call the more hands-on ones. Um, these take a lot of different forms. Um, API Find, Import IO are probably the most interesting ones. So you have to sort of like build your own scraper through their interface. And uh, they're really powerful, robust solutions, honestly. And these are full-fledged companies that make money off this stuff. So kind of any version or variation you can need of scraping, they've figured a lot of those problems out. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about that, but API-ify actually uses like Puppeteer under the hood to do a lot of their scraping. And like I said, just like sort of the sky's the limit for some of these things actually. Um, you know, I think API-ify provides you your own API endpoint for you to hit if, uh, you know, once they scrape your data, right? So instead of just handing it back to you in like a raw format, you can actually programmatically hit it based on how they scrape stuff for you. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about this Kimono Labs. It's actually, it's like a, it's actually Porsche, but Porsche is, it's an open source library. We'll talk about it more, but it's pretty similar to Kimono Labs, which is defunct, but I actually heard about Kimono Labs like years ago, and I thought it was one of the coolest things I've ever seen because Kimono Labs let you spin up a website like inside of their site and then you could literally like sort of have a WYSIWYG editor which stands for what you see is what you get if you've never heard of that before. You can literally just like point and click and say this is data that I want and it is going to be called the title and you can just like point and click on the interface of the site itself to like build your own scraper which I thought was really freaking cool when I first thought. Sweet. So uh, the benefits of some of these sort of like hosted API solutions. Um, some of them, you know, I, I mentioned a lot already, but I, you know, one of them has like a shared open source data set, uh, you know, database that you can kind of query through. So some of the things I saw in there were like a list of all of the subreddits. Um, I saw one that was like all of the government contractors that the Brazilian government like does business with. Um, but, you know, as is the folly with any open source software, those data sets were all from 2016, right? So not super useful. Um, one of them sort of operated off kind of like a an image library, you know, format. So similar to how you would have like a Docker image, you could sort of build custom Docker images from like a Docker hub library. They had their own sort of like scraper image library that you could sort of download and build your own scrapers off of. Um, and I, I mentioned some of these already, but like they could provide your own custom APIs to hit the data they scrape for you. Uh, they have a lot of like third party integrations to pass that data through to whatever you want. Uh, like I said, all in all, it's really not a terrible option. Three. So uh, this was solution five. I gave it honorable mention because it's not quite web scraping, but it's definitely solved our problem before, and it's just sort of like abusing an API in a way that wasn't meant. So the example that I've used for this was we had a, we needed a, just an aggregate of a bunch of jobs for students to apply to, and so uh, we had sort of built these like custom scrapers for Greenhouse and Lever. And so Greenhouse and Lever don't really provide an API that's just like, here's a bunch of jobs for this area. So we built one that was more programmatic and we would just sort of add company names to our system and it would roll through each company one at a time and hit the custom endpoint for each one of those companies. Um, and so what I thought was cool about that is it, uh, it, we weren't using it how it was supposed to be, right? And like the endpoint was originally for the companies themselves to be able to like post their own jobs in their own sites. But um, I, th I thought it was worth mentioning because there's always sort of like, there's more than one way to you know accomplish any task that you're trying to get done. Cool, so try to speed through that a little bit, but um, let's imagine you kind of go through all those options in your head and sort of weigh the costs and benefits to all those and you decide that um, Let's, let's build our own scraper, screw it, it's pretty fun. So, um, when I was doing a bunch of my research, I just kept popping up that some of the most popular languages to scrape in tended to be Python, Node, or Ruby. I mean, it's conjecture, but I would assume that it's because those languages are pretty beginner friendly, they're pretty easy to use, they're dynamic, um, you know, they're pretty popular in general, not just to scrape in, so I would assume that there's correlation there, right? Um, I found some other interesting sort of scraping solutions. Uh, I found one called Gargle for Java. 
uh, one called River Web, which is sort of like a plug-in for Elasticsearch. Uh, I found an interesting one called Percolate. I think it popped up on Reddit or something the other day, but it's like a CLI tool to just like take a PDF screenshot of a site, which I thought was pretty interesting. It didn't really fit into here, but I was like, sometimes you need PDFs and stuff, right? Um, and then in sort of uh, different languages, Elixir and Go have their own sort of libraries to help uh, HTML parse, which is what we'll get into in a minute, but um, useful libraries for web scraping. Um, what's important about those is that those are, you know, fast thread friendly languages. So if you really need to like speed up your scraping, uh, you know, using a language that has that stuff sort of built in already is, you know, a useful thing. Sweet. Um, and, you know, in reality, you can build a simple scraper in any language you want. And it's pretty easy to just say, uh, build a web scraper in whatever language in Google and it's there. So it's pretty easy stuff. Um, so some of the libraries for each of these, you know, I'm, I'm going to go through the time at the top three that I sort of mentioned already, but see, these are, these are some of the libraries that you would use to sort of build a simple scraper in Python. Um, so this is Scrapey and Beautiful Soup. Um, Beautiful Soup is an HTML parser and Scrapey is, it's, it's not quite an HTTP library, it's got more robust API for scraping. Um, Node. Uh, I found one called Node HTML parser, but the big one is Cheerio. So those are, again, more HTML parsers. Then we have Ruby. So the big ones here are Nokogiri and Mechanize. So Mechanize allows you to, it's not quite a full like browser-based solution, but it does allow you to sort of interact with the page more dynamically than like a simple HTTP request. Um, and so we're gonna go through some of these more in detail. Um, before we do that, I wanted to sort of like split out the two, you know, the two different kinds of scrapers that I've sort of like stumbled upon. I was doing research and I was able to kind of group them into two different halves. So there's the simple and the more complex one. So the simple one is really just fetching HTML from an endpoint and then you parse it. Um, there's some limitations to that which we'll go into in a minute, but for now, the other version is that uh, the complex scraper spins up a physical browser and uses that to interact with the page that you're on. So you have a lot more robust ability to click on things and interact with elements on the page. Sweet. So just making a couple of assumptions, uh, scraping is going to be performed on a server, so we're using server-side languages for the most part. Um, there is no API for the data we want, that's why we're building a scraper, and uh, we have to scrape it ourselves. So uh, I'm going to show some code snippets. I took screenshots of them. I hope they're easy to see. I didn't realize I was on a 9 TV format. But um, I, uh, I gave a presentation. We were doing like a demo at a hackathon two years ago. And uh, the internet cut out like right in the middle of our presentation. So I desperately avoid live code demos if I can, because that was awful. So um, I wanted to just kind of I built a couple really simple scrapers. They're not really interacting with the page much because that's really dependent on like what are the you know how nestly deep it, uh, deeply nested are you know the tags you're clicking on and pulling out. So that part that's different every time. But I wanted to sort of build like uh, the simple structure and how it would look like, right? So this is just like a function that you can run with like you know you go to the CLI and just say like run this file with Node, right? And it, and it runs. So you can see here that we're pulling in uh, Cheerio. Uh, PD is just sort of like a pretty print format for Node. And then uh, Request, which is just an HTTP library. So you can see that with this like, uh, the simple scraper, all we're doing is requesting the URL, uh, returns an HTML object, we pass that HTML object to Cheerio, and then we have that sort of like jQuery type syntax that we can query that HTML object for, right? So class IDs, uh, anything we want, right? So uh, I, I kind of went through it already, but um, all we're doing, right, HTTP response is a string. It comes back. We use Cheerio to parse it. Um, and then we use the Cheerio API to extract whatever data we want, and then we do whatever we want with it. Um, I think I put on that slide there, I mean, save it to a data store, write it to a CSV or an Excel file. Uh, you could send it off to another endpoint, another service, whatever you want. Sweet. So, same scraper. I made it a little more 2018. So I split off uh, a, a git prompt function, and I used the library to sort of like fetch a prompt from the CLI. So this way, when you run it, it's not a hard-coded URL. So it accepts the you know input from the user from the prompt. Um, it uses async await format. Um, it uh, used to using fetch, which is you know more 
modern, nicer uh, HTTP library to use. Um, but again, it's, it's the same principle at the end of the day. Uh, this is a Python one. I used it with Scrapey and with Beautiful Soup. So Beautiful Soup is the one that's actually like parsing the HTML, and uh, Scrapey is sort of like the one that's actually like visiting the page and gives you the more functionality to like do some clicking around and uh, interact with the page more. Uh, and this is the Ruby one. Um, same thing. HTTP party is the HTTP library, and Nogogiri is the HTML parser. And I mean, it's stupid easy. So. Um, dang, you're saying, that's so easy, why doesn't everyone do this all the time? Um, this is the more complicated one which actually just writes the CSV, um, and that's the CSV that grew up. But, there's issues to this, and it, it sort of comes with like modern front-end web frameworks. Um, so, I found this on the Cheerio uh, documentation, and I was just going to read it for you because I think it did a really good job sort of telling you the limitations of this approach. So it says that Cheerio parses markup and provides an API for traversing and manipulating the resulting data structure. It does not interpret the result as a web browser does. Specifically, it does not produce a visual rendering, apply CSS, load external resources, or execute JavaScript. So um, what's important about this is uh, if it, you know, if it's built in React, right, if the site you're building is built in React, it won't work. Um, so the example is I scraped Airbnb.com, sort of one of those simple scrapers, and all you get back is like basically a head tag with a bunch of like JavaScript tags and uh, a ton of meta tag data. And that's it because you need that React to uh, run in order to sort of build that DOM visualization in the browser. And because these simple HTML parsers don't run JavaScript, you don't get a lot of that data. Um, and so, yeah, I sort of mentioned this isn't about React, but that's basically, you know, it's like simplifying the hell out of it, but that's kind of how React's working. Um, and it's funny because I woke up this morning and I was on Reddit and I found one of the top stories on the React.js React .js subreddit today was this guy had a site with like 10,000 unique pages and so much content. And he goes, why is Google not able to like crawl it. So Google has some things they do to help crawl React, but it's harder for it. And so everyone was just like, oh, you can't, it doesn't work like that. And I just thought it was funny because it's relevant to the talk I was giving today. Um, so fun fact, the way that you sort of get around some of that stuff is you can pre-render your React on the server side. So that way it's sent across as HTML to begin with. And then uh, I found a service called pre-render that someone had sort of put in the comments and pre-render actually like will pull your React out of your site build an HTML response and they have sort of like an API that when Google's crawlers come to your site and they're sort of like, do you have anything you want to tell me? And uh, you can be like, yes I do, here's what my site looks like because it's React, you won't get it otherwise. Sweet. So, that won't work, we need a more powerful solution. So sort of the meat of the talk today is the, kind of the modern way that you want to scrape the web today is with a browser based solution, right? Because the browser sort of solves all those problems because it actually does execute CSS, it will execute the JavaScript. So it's sort of, you know, it, it, it's a browser. So everything that the site was designed to do in the regular browser that we use to go to it, you know, in the URL bar will happen in our sort of programmatic solutions as well. So um, sort of the top ones that I found were Puppeteer, you could use Selenium, uh, Cypress, or Capybara. So, uh, as I sort of mentioned, API-ify, one of the services I talked about earlier, actually uses uh, Puppeteer under the hood. So if you go to their site, they would love telling you about it. So, um, yeah, I was gonna go to each one. So, Puppeteer spins up a headless Chrome browser, uh, lets you interact with pages, and that's basically what they're all doing. So some of these uh, slides are gonna kind of rehash themselves a little bit. Um, I found that, so the, you know, the, the, the point here is that like, oh, we have like modern 2018 JavaScript front end frameworks that we need to be able to scrape. I also found it helpful for like the opposite end of the spectrum where one of the job boards I was trying to scrape was like built in Cold Fusion, I think, and it just did some of the weirdest crap I have ever seen. Like, it was bizarre, right? So some of these libraries expect things to happen. Like when you submit a form, like some sort of re-render action happens, whether that's like a navigation event or it's changing the DOM. And this thing was just like, it was doing some really janky stuff. And so Puppeteer helps sort of like eliminate that. Cause like I said, some of these other tools are sort of like tightly coupled with some of those like classical rest actions. And this is more like single page app friendly. 
Sweet. So Cypress is a test framework. I won't go too far into this because there was like a workshop about Cypress, but the basic principle is that it's like an end-to-end -end node test framework. So it uses a Chrome browser under the hood as well. It allows you to sort of like spin up a Chrome browser and test your site. But uh, all it's really doing is providing an API for you to control the browser and click on things and go to places that you want to go. So you can kind of hack into it and tell it to do whatever you want it to do. And it's the same concept for Capybara as well. So Capybara is a little bit of an older one, but it's primarily used for like Rails, um, you know, front end feature test. Um, but yeah. So uh, I have some examples. Tried to zoom in a little bit, but I built some different scrapers using Puppeteer, and then I went with Capybara. And so my didn't know a ton about this. I had sort of built a Puppeteer scraper before, but I was like. You know, part of the talk, you know, description said I wanted to sort of build these out and sort of rate them on how easy I thought they were to use. Um, so this was sort of my first attempt at uh, a puppeteer scraper. And I thought when I was writing this talk and I was like, the solution is puppeteer, like bring the light to the people. And I don't think that actually after doing this, I think it's a super powerful, robust solution, but I found it super hard to use. And it's, I mean, you can see there's a ton of the weights there. So basically every interaction you have with the page object is an asynchronous event. And it's nasty, man. I, I had uh, so many issues. There's this one error that kept popping up, which was target closed, which is just sort of a catch-all error for like something happened. We don't know what's going on. And there's like, it doesn't handle stale references to elements. So the example that I was trying to do is I was trying to go to lever.com on their careers page. And then under that, they have sort of like the listing of their current jobs. So I was just trying to build a scraper to like, cool, I'm on that page. I find the engineering section, click through to every single page, pull out the jobs like title and subscription and its location, go back and then just hit every single job. There's only four on their page right now. I was not able to get it, you know, I sort of time boxed the amount of time I wanted to spend on writing the scrapers for this talk, and I wasn't actually able to figure that out in Puppeteer in time. So every time I keep going, like, how to do this thing in Puppeteer on Google, it just kept telling me all the solutions were like, go to a page, and all the data's there already. Like, well, that doesn't help, because I need to be able to, like, you know, navigate through, and it was not easy. I do think that this is a very robust solution, so if you sort of figure out what those patterns are for whatever you're trying to accomplish, it probably is the way to go, but for like a beginner and you wanna spin something up real quick, I had a hell of a time with this thing. I think I was on this thing for three hours probably, trying to like get this to not suck. And all, the best I could do was I click on this, and it's real cut off there on some of the code, unfortunately, but um, it, it pulls a single job out, and then it writes it to a CSV file. Uh, I have the like the version I was trying to make work where I try and click through on everything, but this one does not work. And I tried variations of like how how I thought I could do it. I could open up a new page, but I, I was like, all right, it's, it sucks. I hate it. So um, uh, I was going to show you some of the API available, though. It's uh, so you really start right here with this. Uh, you launch Puppeteer and you can pass it headless true false. So passing it in headless mode will make it faster. Um, then, you know, you have to wait for things to happen, so then you pass it a new page, you go to that page, um, you know, with this URL object, and then you have to do this really goofy thing when you're doing, like, some kind of navigation event, is you have to use promise.all. And so there's, like, uh, variations on, like, waiting for selector or wait for navigation, and wait for selector seems less buggy than wait for navigation, but you have to wait for both of those things to resolve. And then, uh, so all this is doing is, like, page loads, and then I want to click on the job that I want. And then I wait for the job to show up, and then I'm passing the data through. And the other thing I found odd with this is like sort of like the way to pull data out of the page is I thought it'd be easy to be like, oh, give me some kind of jQuery syntax, and I can just call like dot inner text on that data, and it's not how it works at all. I have to pass it this evaluate function where I just have to write like vanilla browser API query selector stuff. Um, and that's how I got the text out of it. And then the rest of it's pretty easy. Um, I have some of these things commented out and they're just sort of like uh, two of the probably, you know, more useful features on Puppeteer, which you can screenshot really easily and you can uh, two PDF pages pretty easily. So I sort of split those off into their own functions and so it's as easy as just calling page.pdf and you pass it the path name. And same thing with screenshot. So, you know, those things are super useful. Uh, that's sort of why I thought it was pertinent to uh, mention that percolate library, which was the, sort of the PDF from CLI tool, because um, it's obviously a thing that people need. 
Um, this does work though, I got the one job out of it and that's the CSV file that it writes, so yay. Um, so then I was like, okay, what are my other solutions? And uh, I was talking with a friend and we were like, oh yeah, Cappy Bar, we should do that. Holy crap. I mean, it's like an older solution, but I got it working, so it successfully goes through all the pages and goes to all the jobs, and I, it was under an hour I was able to get this up and out. So, if there was a big takeaway of like what I think you should use as like a beginner to web scrape, it's probably Capybara. So, um, same thing, right? I'm just including in Selenium WebDriver and Capybara. You just have to sort of register. And like, seriously, the first 12 lines of this thing is just setting up Capybara. And then from there, it's, you know, you set up a new session, uh, you visit, you know, lever.co careers, I find how many H1s I want, that gives me four of them, and then I just roll through each time, find each new selector, find the index of whatever one I'm looking for particularly, go to the page, pull the data out, and all I have to do is say, go back. And then it just works, and it's amazing. Uh, that does not just work in Puppeteer. You know, going back just was like, what? I don't know what you're talking about. My session is failing. So, um, yeah, I was like super stoked that it was, was super easy to use and I was like, yes, so if I can bring the light to the people, it is that Capybara is probably the way to go. So um, I did have this working earlier. I don't know where it's going to spin up the Chrome browser, but it physically spins up the browser. It's on my screen, but it's clicking through and then it uh, prints to the console whenever it's done. So it works. Yay. So that was sort of all the like live coding-ish that I was doing as a very controlled environment so the internet didn't fail me. Um, so, you know, obviously there's upsides and downsides to everything. Most of these are like sort of Chrome-based solutions. So if you've ever used Chrome on your computer before, you know that those are, can be memory hogs, you know? And so when I was sort of playing with the solution of um, Puppeteer to like spin up a new page every time, well like, that might help me for my for example problem, but like if I need to start scraping 800 things. I can't spin up 800 web pages. It's going to burn my computer to the ground. So, um, and the other thing is that it is spinning up a physical browser, so that takes time and energy and resources. So it's a little slower than just like a raw HTTP request. So if you can, just try and do raw HTTP, but more than likely you're probably going to get stuck with one of these browser-based solutions. Um, and this is one, I had trouble fitting this in. It's Porsche. It is uh, an open source tool that you can spin up locally and use it to build that sort of WYSIWYG style web scraper. Um, I didn't play with it that much, but it's uh, probably more friendly for super beginners. Maybe you don't even need to have that many tech skills if they can follow along basic like CLI commands or just get it up and running on your computer. Um, so one of those, uh, I think it was Scraping Hub, one of those paid services is actually like they're hosting this Porsche library in their own system for you to use is how it's working. But uh, it is a useful tool nonetheless. Um, so then uh, I had some more sort of advanced topics we could kind of talk through a little bit. Uh, I didn't want to get too in the weeds, but um, sort of, you know, if you need to step up the complexity away from a function, usually that next, you know, hierarchical step up would be some sort of class-based solution. So you could sort of write a class where you're sort of like spinning up the browser in a constructor of some kind, and then you could sort of easily break out functions and how you want to use them into, you know, different class methods and stuff like that. So um, I was going to show sort of an example of one that I had sort of worked on. So it's just, it's a sort of like base scraper, right? And so I was trying to pass more of the like config options in this constructor and then there's an init browser function. And so that's handling just spinning up the browser and there is a closed browser function. I sort of like, call out the fields that I'm eventually going to want to use later on to scrape, um, you know, the actual parsing and saving of that data somehow is all sort of in this base class. Uh, the screenshot functionality, you can see where I got some of these functions for the other scraper that I wrote. And then, you know, that gives you the freedom to sort of like, yeah, I'm scraping jobs for Miami. And then all this you have to do is sort of like write this one scrape function that is actually taking care of like clicking on the things you need to click on. Um, and side note, these things can get really freaking nasty. <laughs> Just based on, you know, imagine, you know, using any sort of React UI library that's just like randomly generating class names and stuff for elements. So this stuff can be grody. So that's where like there's a way to like right click inspect on specific elements and find their reference makes things a lot easier. And then um, uh, what else was I going to say? Something else. 
doesn't matter. Um, so this is just sort of an example of how you can start to build OO examples out. Um, I saw some really neat ones online where this, it was actually that dude who sort of built the scraper to like look for books on sale. And so he like published his own Ruby gem and the Ruby gem that he published was just about like logging into Amazon with his credentials. So then he had this like other scraper that like inherited from that and was then the more specific one of like, okay, now I'm in and now I'm like scraping the things I want out of the books. And then you could take that same Amazon uh, scraper and build another one that's like buying and stuff or whatever. Um, so it's, it's extremely powerful, uh, what the? I don't think that's me. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely not me. Um, anyway, we're really close to being done anyway. Uh, the other topic was multi-threading. Uh, there's, uh, <laughs> so um, this idea is that if you are using sort of a browser-based solution, those are, you know, resource intensive. Okay, that's me. Um, I don't know where my stuff is though. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, so it's like multi-threading, so cool. Now I need to scrape a lot of things simultaneously. How do I kind of do that? Um, so I found a cool library called Puppeteer Cluster, which does allow you to like spin up clusters of Puppeteer instances to scrape all at once. Um, the other solution is, I had sort of called out those Go and Elixir libraries let you do some stuff too, but you could probably use a more thread-friendly language to begin with, um, handle scraping that way if you wanted to. Um, but that's basically the end of the talk, so, um, you know, plenty of time for Q&A and chilling. Thank you. Yeah, again, I'm Derek. Uh, if you want to get a hold of me, it's just at Derek. I'm Denver Dev. That's my email. And then I did sort of host all of the examples and solutions that I wrote up on uh, my GitHub. So, yeah. Anyone have any questions? It's kind of like a comment. Um, can you open another browser tab? In uh, Puppeteer? No, oh. oh, man. Uh, Risky click. Since you're talking about the job plan, Scraping up. There's a Chrome extension called uh, Hunter with no E, and it lets you scrape pages. So it's specifically designed to scrape content off of job sites. So it's not exactly what we're doing. But, uh, well, I mean, it's important. I, it, that is something that like I found. I didn't like get to in the talk, but yeah, there's definitely like extensions that allow you to do some of this stuff as well. Um, yeah, that's definitely something I didn't talk about at all, but that's totally a thing. So there's other ones that are more general purpose for scraping. Uh, kind of like Porsche, there's one called DivBot, where you kind of have a hosted solution, but it gives you a render page and you can select elements and, and go through that. And it has the concept of array, so it'll literally go into like, I don't just want the title, I want like, the description. So go through all 20 things on the page, get the description and go back. Sweet. Yeah, love it. And if anyone has like the solution to getting Puppeteer to like navigate nicely, I would love to hear it. So please, please tell me. <laughs>